For as long as Donald Trump has been in the White House, we've been talking about who's going to be kicked out of it. Steve Bannon, Sean Spicer, Reince Priebus, Jeff Sessions, James Comey, H.R. McMaster, Sebastian Gorka, any identifiable figure not related through blood or marriage to the president has found their employment the subject of just widespread speculation and rumors. This has been fed by anonymous sources in and surrounding the administration, but it's also been fed oftentimes by Donald Trump himself. Now, seven months in, some officials have been fired, but others remain. For now, what explains this apparent chaos? Is this all part of the president's plan? The pattern established during the Trump campaign, which was defined in many ways by infighting. Roger Stone and Sam Nunberg were two longtime advisors to Trump who, along with Hope Hicks, acted as the gatekeepers to him. But Nunberg didn't get along with Corey Lewandowski, the campaign manager, who was new to Trump's orbit. He was fired and then rehired and then fired once more. And depending on who you believe, Stone either was fired or he quit right after that. Then Lewandowski butted heads with Jared Kushner and with Paul Manafort. He was subsequently fired in June of 2016, but that didn't mean that his enemies were safe. Manafort was let go at the behest of Kushner and later that summer. Steve Bannon and Kellyanne Conway took over in his absence and then they joined the White House. The first few months of the administration were strange because hardly anyone at the senior staff level was fired. These were people who were the main characters in all of the so-called palace intrigue stories that came out every day. You know, every day it seemed like there was going to be a new wrinkle in the drama. You know, the president was unhappy with his chief of staff or with his chief strategist. But for a while, nothing happened. While Sally Yates and then Mike Flynn and then James Comey were dismissed, the inner circle remained intact. At the time, senior White House officials told me that part of the problem was just the way that the president talks. You know, everyone is familiar with this by now, right? He just sort of flails around suggesting things. He'll say, man, this thing is bad, it's not going well. Or, what do we do about this person? Should we get rid of them? He does this at his rallies, he does this at press conferences, and he does this in private. During Thanksgiving at Mar-a-Lago, Trump asked random guests who he should choose for Secretary of State. A senior White House official told me at the time that at first it was just horrifying to be at dinner with the President of the United States and other dignitaries and have him single you out and say, hey, do you think he's doing a good job? Should I keep him? Is he fucking up? But then the official realized you just can't take that seriously. You can't analyze it too much because he may not mean it at all. The president himself has admitted to seeing his staff duke it out in the press and, and being flattered by it because he's the Donald, he's the emperor, and what he wants to watch is people kill each other just to get his affection. This official, I should add, the one that told me that story about being at dinner with the president, he was never fired. But midway through Trump's first year in office, the entire senior staff has been reshuffled or removed. But why? One explanation is that Trump is just easily bored, right? He likes to entertain himself, and he does this by creating and then presiding over conflict. This was the case with the tabloids in the 1980s and in the 1990s. It was the case with pro wrestling. Hey, look at this! It was the case with reality television, and then with his campaign, and now with his presidency. Another is that Trump likes to fire people in a suspenseful manner. His catchphrase literally is, you're fired after all. You're fired. It's the only president I can think of with a catchphrase. With Bannon, for instance, he knew he was going to fire him even when he came out publicly at a press conference and said that he's a good person and he's not a racist. He added a tell, however. He said, we'll see. We'll see what happens with Mr. Bannon, but he's a good person, and I think the press treats him, frankly, very unfairly. That's a presidential equivalent to next week on The Apprentice. Another theory is that he doesn't actually enjoy letting people go. The staffers whom he's personally fired speak of his apparent reluctance to do, to do so and to break the news to them. And nearly everyone he has fired, from the campaign at least, remains in his ear, whether visiting the White House or Air Force One or talking to him on the phone. None of which is to say that this is all part of some master plan. In the avalanche of staff reshuffling we've been experiencing lately, one thing has necessarily led to the next. Pundits always try to do this. They look at some crazy tweet or statement as part of a big scheme from, to deflect from policy matters or the like. 
I've been reporting on him every day since June of 2015, and I've never spoken to anyone close to him who believes that he's capable of that. And so it's with that in mind that we should assess these staff shakeups. He's unhappy and emotional, and since looking inward is obviously not an option, the people surrounding him, and especially those flying close to the sun, are the likeliest to be singed. Mooch was brought in to oust Priebus, which led to Spicer's resignation, which gave us Sarah Huckabee. John Kelly gave us Mooch's firing, which led to Hicks's elevation. And Kelly's appointment eventually resulted in Bannon getting the axe. This was not the product of some kind of all-hands PowerPoint presentation where the members of the staff decided that this was best for the White House and for the country more broadly. It was total and utter chaos, which is just what the president wants.